I think of so many young people and elderly people who are malnourished and just not making good food choices and what that impact is on their neurotransmitters and leading to such a massive amount of prescription antidepressants when really they just- There's a very fundamental solution. Angelo Keeley, welcome to the Dr. Tina show. I'm so excited to have you on. You are the CEO of Keon. You have recently shared your Keon aminos with me and I love them. And you're gonna come on today and talk about the importance of muscle, protein, amino acids. And we're gonna dive into the biochemistry about the topic I am constantly harping on, which is how critical muscle mass is. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Tina. Yeah, I'm excited to dig into this. I've covered with my audience on repeat, like uh, I'm beating a dead horse, how critical it is to constantly be building muscle and prioritizing that, especially as we age. My audience, I would say, is probably more of that middle age group. And so I'm excited for you to share your insight and bring some science into it. Maybe this will help people understand how important nutrition is on top of the actual act of the muscle building. So can you share a little bit about yourself? I'm really intrigued by your story. Yeah. So again, thanks so much for having me on the show. And I am very passionate about this subject as I think one of the key pillars of health really overall. And why I believe it's one of the key pillars of health is I think coming from an experience of, of experiencing it myself. Uh, reading so much of the research and literature. And I really was immersed in nutrition um, and an interest in this topic at a pretty young age. My, my parents were in the natural health food and the supplement business in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, we were, I was raised a pescatarian and uh, we ate fish like once a week. So I, I never had, I was never, I never had an over-the-counter medicine. I never didn't even have my birth certificate until I was seven, when I was six, when I went to elementary school. So I was raised very much just thinking about which foods I ate and what kind of, honestly, dietary supplements and vitamins that we might consider to help, you know, supplement those food choices that we were making. Uh, so really, like going back to the very beginning, that's kind of how I got interested in this. Um, but naturally, like my path progressed as I as I aged and I had a lot of, you know, later learning experiences that, that made it even more potent for me. Yeah. So my podcast producer introduced me to your company and I had seen it here and there and I got some of the amino sent to me. And to be honest with you, I haven't really been that diligent about taking my aminos and somewhere in the last few years, perimenopause hit or started, I should say. And it's become very evident the importance of supplementing correctly. I'm not a huge fan of, it's funny, I'm a naturopathic doctor. You'd think I would be a huge fan of supplements, but I find that folks use, we were talking about this before, folks often will use supplements as a crutch instead of doing the work. I'm a big fan of using supplements synergistically with the work. And I think that's a really critical place where essential amino acids come in and these branch chain amino acids, which I've studied for years and years and years. And I've always known they were great for the geriatric population, but I never considered myself as part of that <laughs> until you guys sent me this. <laughs> and we didn't, we didn't target you as part of the geriatric population, just to be clear. I know. I'm in the, I'm in the master's category. Anytime you're over 40, if you do a sport, they call you master. So I'm just, yeah. in, I'm in a master's category. Anyway, um, why, why I mean, essentially amino acids? Like what was that particularly of interest to you for? So I, I think you made a great point too, that supplements should be used as a supplement. And uh, it's really about, you know, crafting a healthy life in today's world. And what are the decisions you can make with whole food? What are the decisions you can make with certain types of exercise? And are there other ways that you can supplement to help reach that more pinnacle of health? And also, I think when you reach certain stages of life or you're in certain phases, if your body's under a lot of stress, uh, if you had an injury, if you're getting older, um, if you're trying to compete as an athlete, if you're trying to, you know, really shift, shift your health quickly, which I'm not a huge fan of. I think things should be taken over a long period of time. But if you're, if you have kind of more aggressive weight loss goals, like these are times when you can start to think about, well, it's a combination of nutrition, exercise, and supplementation. Why essential amino acids? Well, uh, I think that they are, I, I can't, I, it's hard for me to talk about without describing kind of overall the picture of what protein is. Yeah, do it. What amino acids are and why they are, I just, people should know so much more about them. 
Um, so I think I think the main frame, just to kind of get everyone on the same page, is that there's three main macronutrients that people are familiar with outside of micronutrients, and those are carbs, fat, and protein. Protein plays a very different role in the body than carbohydrates or fat do. The primary role of carbohydrates and fat, and I'm not saying the only role, but the primary role of carbohydrates and fat is to actually be converted into energy that your body burns. So you convert the carbohydrates, for example, into ATP, and, and then that's what fuels your body. Protein can be used to do that, but it's, it's really not its primary role. Uh, your body prefers to use carbohydrates and fat for that. What protein's primary role is, is to help uh, basically resynthesize the proteins in your body. So our bodies are, many people are familiar, our bodies are over 50% water. Um, of the part that's not water, that's solid mass, over 50% of that is made up of proteins. And those proteins are made up of amino acids. And so when I say like, you know, this, all this stuff in your body, that's made of proteins. You can think of all of your vital organs, your liver, your heart, your kidneys. Um, but really like most of your body, you know, like your eyeballs, your, your, uh, your skin. Um, but even things people don't think about like enzymes, uh, or proteins, uh, neurotransmitters are amino acids or the derivatives of amino acids. So really all of this stuff in your body is in the space of protein. And I think what people don't realize is that the way that proteins function in the body is that they, uh, they only have a certain half-life. And so they, what they, what they will do is they'll break down. They're always, all the proteins in your body are in some kind of process of breaking down and then resynthesizing. So like literally the tissue in my body, the proteins that make it up break down into 20 unique amino acids. And then the ones that can be reused, you can't reuse them all. If it's maybe a simple way of thinking about it. It's like you're kind of refreshing the proteins in your body. Some are broken down. Um, they're all broken down. And then some, some portion of them are excreted. They get turned into urea. You pee them out like 20 to 30%. And then the rest can get reused to rebuild the proteins, to rebuild liver tissue, to rebuild muscle, to rebuild all these things in your body. So I think the most obvious immediate way you can get this then is if you don't consume protein outside of your body, like through meat, through plants, through free, through free form supplements, your body doesn't have the raw materials to literally rebuild your organs, to rebuild your muscle. That is not the role of carbohydrates. It's not the role of fat. So I think just getting that big picture, like, oh my gosh, protein's not just this thing that like helps satiate me, or it's not just the thing that, you know, is going to make me strong or is going to um, increase my metabolism, which it does all of those things. But it, its primary role is really to like rebuild your whole body. And, um, when you, I think when you get that frame, you're like, whoa, okay, well then like how, how much, you know, how much protein do I need? How, how many amino acids do I need uh, on a daily basis? And the RDA, the recommended daily allowance is, is really like a recommended, it's really like a minimum allowance. It's the minimum that you need to just maintain existing function in a pretty lean person for like your organs to keep functioning. And that's 0.4 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Um, so if, if it's a very low number, but let's just say you weighed hundred pounds, it'd be like 40 grams of protein. If you weigh 200 pounds, it'd be 80 grams of protein. That's like the minimum, bare minimum that you need. And that is really more for a younger person. If you're trying to maintain higher activity levels, if you're trying to maintain more muscle mass, if you're trying to, um, have a certain type of physique. If like basically to have more vibrant health, you really want to be aiming more at like at least the 0.7 to 0.8, if not one gram of protein per pound of body weight. And the reason for that is when you consume, and, and honestly, when we talk about protein, there's all different qualities and forms of protein, but a really high quality protein, we'll just say egg whites. It's very high, it's, it's very digestible and for most people, and it's a very good profile of the amino acids. When you digest it, about half of it is essential amino acids. It's actually less. It's like 40, 45% is essential amino acids. The other half is non-essential amino acids. So like what's the essential amino acids? What's the non-essential? The essential amino acids are the ones that are essential, quote, because your body cannot synthesize them. The non-essential, your body can actually make them. Your liver can actually produce them from the, the essential amino acids. It can convert them into the non-essential. So that's one reason why you really need to get something, a high quality protein is complete protein because it has all nine of these essential amino acids. But on top of that, what's been shown 
uh, more recently in the last 20 years, and it's very important science that everyone should be aware of, is the essential amino acids are the active component of the protein that stimulates protein synthesis. So it's, at, it's not, they're not just the building blocks that get turned into the new proteins in your body. You require all nine of them to actually stimulate the protein synthesis. And you only use a portion of the non-essential amino acids to, um, to, to like fulfill the process to actually build the new proteins in your body, to replace the liver tissue, to replace muscle, et cetera. So really what you want to be focused on in your daily diet is not just, oh, I need, you know, a hundred grams of protein. I really am trying to get like 50 grams of very high quality essential amino acids out of that protein. So it's, it's the underlying active component inside of the protein that you're really trying to get. So when you're evaluating different types of protein sources, it's like, not just as a complete, but like how much of the essential amino acids are in there? Is there enough? Am I really getting the reason why I'm eating the, you know, it's oversimplified for us. It's just protein, but it's not just protein. It's really the quality of the protein based off the essential amino acids in them. So that's why I think it's, I'm very passionate about this and I think it's so important and people should be more aware of this subject. Yeah. It's, you were taking me back to my biochem nutrition days in med school there for a hot second. It, <laughs> it really, it really is critical. It's especially, you know, you touched on as you age, as folks get older, what they don't understand is their stomach lining is atrophying and they're losing the ability to digest and assimilate anything that they eat. And so they actually need more, I believe they need more protein than they would in their forties or fifties when they reach their sixties and seventies. But unfortunately, what most folks do is they decrease their protein intake for a variety of reasons. Often they'll lose a spouse or their partner um, as they age. And so they're eating for one, they're not preparing as much food because there's not a second person there. They start to have dentition issues. So they start to lose the ability to actually masticate and chew the food up. And so I, I see that inducing a lot of frailty and sarcopenia in older folks because a everything I just said, but then they quite simply aren't eating enough and they're not even synthesizing it into their own body appropriately. So that's where I am a big fan of, like I said earlier, when I didn't consider myself the geriatric, <laughs> not yet, <laughs> but I think having an essential amino acid supplement in there is just gets more critical the older we get, as you mentioned. Yeah. I think some of the most interesting studies that specifically cover this actually show how much more protein synthesis is achieved through a free form essential amino acid supplement versus whole protein food as you age. And the reason for that is just what you said. Uh, well, it's, there, it's actually twofold. One is as we age, our ability to digest the proteins and to break them down into the individual 20 amino acids is reduced due to stomach lining, many different parts of, di of the digestive process. On top of that, hormonal changes that we don't fully understand but it's very relative for perimenopausal and postmenopausal women, as well as men. Um, there are changes that occur to where we become less sensitive to stimulate new protein synthesis when we eat amino acids or when we do resistance training. And so for a young person, uh, let's just say a 20 year old who's not exercising, and there's so many different cases of when you would eat and if you exercise or not, but for a 20 year old person who's very healthy, who's not, in the, not currently exercising, one gram of essential amino acids versus one gram of a very high quality protein, the essential amino acids will create twice the protein synthesis as measured, measured in a very sophisticated way. I won't go into it, but fractional synthetic, right? Like it's, it's very clear. Like we can see exactly what happens. In older populations, when you start, it really starts at 30. And then every decade after that, it becomes more and more difficult. The impact of essential amino acids versus a whole food protein becomes three, four, five times the impact of protein synthesis as a whole food protein. So not only is it, you're correct. Like the reason why you're encouraging people to eat even more protein is because guys, as you age, you can't digest it as well. You're not as actually sensitive to it. Resistance training doesn't do as much as it did when you were younger. And so the need the benefits is what I would say rather than the need, but the benefits of taking free form essential amino acids becomes so much greater as you age. It's beneficial to a 20 year old, especially if they're an athlete or they're not meeting like higher protein intake goals. But as you get older, it becomes really, I would say, you know, one of the most, if not the most important supplement that I would consider taking as you age to ensure that you maintain muscle mass. And that's because muscle mass is one of the most directly correlated things related to reducing all cause mortality. 
if you don't have sufficient muscle mass as you age, then naturally you can't, rem you can't maintain the same amount of activity levels, which help you maintain better cardiovascular health. If you fall and have some kind of injury, or you're more likely to fall and have an injury, but if you do have that, you lose the muscle mass. Like if you're just bedridden, you start to lose muscle mass. Um, if you undergo some kind of a treatment, you know, like a more intense treatment for a chronic illness, et cetera, you likely will lose a lot of muscle mass. Um, and muscle is what help regulates your blood sugar. Muscle, I mean, it plays so many important roles that it's like, it's an asset that you really want to be investing in and it's saving up with it's like a savings account you know like a it's like your health retirement account <laughs> that you invest in as you age and it becomes that much more challenging as you age and so that's why i would say you know essential amino acids specifically for people really starting at 30 but every decade after that become something to be much more seriously considered as a, as a daily supplement i yeah i love that that's a great way of putting it it's it's non-negotiable, the strength training part, but the fueling, the strength training part is something I even myself have been, I'm not a big eater. You know, I've not had great digestive health my whole life. And it's something that's been very challenging for me to hit that protein threshold that I'm supposed to, especially per meal. Cause you haven't talked about the leucine threshold yet, but I would love if you would in a second. Um, so having something like this is just kind of a no brainer for those of us who, you know, we're called hard gainers, but I think we're just under eaters, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it's just, it's challenging to get your needs met. I, I wanted to tell you the story of a patient I had. She was in her nineties. She was my mentor who passed away. She was my mentor's patient when he was super young and started his practice. And she stayed with him all those decades and then became my patient. And she had horrific thoracic pain and I would do injections on her and she laid down on my table face down. And it was literally like skin up against bone against her spine. And I mean, I could palpate no musculature. And I was like, well, no wonder you hurt. You're hanging off your ligaments. You've got no muscle holding you together. And I put her on a really high quality protein powder and had her come back in a month. And she was doing two scoops a day and just was within, and it had a high essential amino acid count just within two months of that. She, when she came back, I could palpate muscle. She was doing nothing else. I mean, it was just that obvious that suddenly there was not only skin, but there was tissue underneath it. And there was muscle there. It wasn't robust, but I was like, man, this really makes a difference in these folks. Yeah. And I would say that, I mean, you make a great point that resistance training is the best stimulus, like doing some form of resistance training creates the best stimulus to, to provoke basically development of new muscle. But what people don't understand is that actually consuming a high enough amount of essential amino acids in a free form supplement or in a, like a protein powder, et cetera, it stimulates muscle protein synthesis. It is not solely the materials that get utilized by the stimulation. It actually provokes it. And one of the best studies that covers that is um, NASA, they funded a few different studies specifically to understand how to basically limit the amount of muscle loss that happened with astronauts in space when they had no resistance training, like there, there's none. And so they did, a, they did a 28 day study. They ended up doing future ones down to just 14 and seven because they realized that the shorter studies proved just as much. And it was pretty painful to make someone do this for 28 days, but they had people at complete bed rest for 28 days. So you were not able to get up at all, but they supplemented them with essential amino acids and a small amount of carbohydrates to create an insulin response. Um, Th six times a day. So basically 15 grams of essential amino acids, six times a day. And the, all, the participants had net muscle increase after 28 days with no resistance training. Now they lost strength and they lost muscle endurance, but they actually did not lose the muscle tissue and they increased slightly. That just shows you that actually through nutrition, now that's a very clinical kind of super intense use of nutrition, but through nutrition itself, like you described, actually probably just prescribing to your client to take these higher doses of protein powder that were high in essential amino acids, it actually did stimulate new muscle. It, it, I, and I think lots of people don't, they don't think that's possible. And like, even like in kind of bro gym science, they don't, they're like, no, you have to lift weights. It's um, nutrition can play a pretty impactful role. And I think specifically in, in older populations too, where it's like these little tweaks can really have pretty massive benefits. It was shocking. My assistant was there both times. She saw it. And I remember her eyes. I was like, I'm pushing on my patient's back. And I was like, look, look mm -hmm. at this. And she goes, oh my gosh. I mean, because it was skeletal. It was like, you know, prior she was looking pretty, pretty bad. 
Uh, I see this a lot actually in women. So my whole practice was regenerative injection therapy. So prolotherapy, PRP stem cells long before it was a cool thing to do long before the term biohacking or any of that was around. And the one thing I would see consistently is this chronic pain picture in women due to low, uh, well, due to low activity, but more importantly, due to low protein intake. And they just would hurt from tip to toe. And an elderly doctor once told me this great, great, uh, you know, pain management guy. He, he said, get your female patients to double or triple their protein. Cause those RDA levels you shared, I mean, most people aren't even getting that much in a day. And so he suggested, I encourage these patients and often I wouldn't even treat them. I'd be like, I'm not touching you until you beef up your protein intake. And the results on their pain resolution was pretty remarkable across the board. And it's the one thing I have to remember myself when I'm starting to hurt everywhere. Cause I do have kind of a chronic pain picture. I'm like, Oh, I've been really skimping on the protein and that's not, not good. So this is, yeah. I mean, what you said, the, the essential amino acids themselves will induce that muscle synthesis irregardless of activity level. And that's pretty compelling, especially if you couple it with activity, like, I mean, that's the best solution. <laughs> yeah. That's the best solution. I would never say like, don't exercise or don't do resistance training. Yeah. I think do both. Um, yeah. and just as you age kind of, but not kind of both become that much more important individually and in, in conjunction with each other. Absolutely. Cause these women, it's so weird. And I, I was guilty of this too, before I discovered, I didn't discover strength training until I was 40. And for me, it was a matter of like, I was starting to feel fragile. I was starting to feel like if I fell down, I was going to shatter. It was not a good feeling. Mm. And I was riddled with tons of autoimmune conditions and the list goes on and on. But more importantly, I was skinny fat and I knew it. And metabolically, my labs were showing that. And I knew that was the kiss of death. What I don't think people realize is when you have metabolic dysfunction, which is something I, and I'd love to hear your take on it too, something I talk about all the time. Being obese and metabolically busted is one thing, but being thin and metabolically busted is way more dangerous. Like those are the folks that mm -hmm. have very high mortality rates. And can you talk about that a little bit? Like why these women, we women as they age, it's like they want to stay in their high school genes. They end up the same size as they were when they were 18. Only now it's just a bone with a bunch of fat around it. And they're really shooting themselves in the foot because they're losing a lot of muscle mass on this journey. Yeah, I think my now I'm I'm not a woman, so I'm 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 reflecting on this from someone who's just witnessing from outside what seems to be happening. You know, um, my take on this is that people take kind of a multiple things are true at the same time, and people focus on one thing. They think I want to be this certain size, I want to be this certain weight. I'm going to do that through controlling caloric intake and through trying to burn more calories than I consume, which that that is not incorrect. If you consume, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's quality of the calories, et cetera. But if I, if I burn more calories every single day than I consume, I will progressively lose weight and I will get skinnier. That said, if then I consume a bunch of more calories again, I, that, that are more than whatever I consumed previously, than, than what I'm burning, I'm going to put weight back on. Now it comes down to the quality of those calories and what those calories are. And this is why I think the point I made earlier is so important. When you consume protein, its primary role is not just, and it's not primarily to like to be turned to burn calories, to fuel your energy levels. It can be, especially if you don't have carbohydrates, you don't have fat, like it's gonna, it's gonna use more of them. But its primary role is to help replenish the amino acids that you need for your body to build new proteins. So if you cut calories and you cut protein intake, what happens is not only do you lose fat, you lose a lot of muscle. And then if you consume a lot of calories again, more than you're consuming, you put back, but, the, but it's not a bunch of protein or not a bunch of amino acids. You're not doing training. You put on fat and you do that yo-yo dieting back and forth and back and forth. And what ends up happening in the end is that you've lost all your muscle mass and you end up with this kind of skinny fat situation. So it's, it's, um, it's ignoring, I think the big idea of most people, I think, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to like knock on vanity. I think vanity is fine. I think wanting to be beautiful, wanting to be handsome, wanting to be strong, wanting to have a figure that you're proud of wanting to fit into your jeans, that those are not, um, somehow things that we shouldn't want yet. If that's like what you really want, if you really want to have this toned body and you want to have this vibrant health and you want to be beautiful or handsome, um, it's, it's going to take this other component of 
the right types of exercise. It's going to take proper protein nutrition because what you're really trying to get is like a tone lean. You're trying to get a toned body. You're not trying yeah. to get this like skinny, frail body. I don't think. I think some, you know, some people, women and men, maybe are afraid of muscle. They think, oh, if I put on, if I eat too much protein or I exercise too much in resistance training, I'm going to get bulky. It's pretty hard to get really bulky. Like those bodybuilder people, natural bodybuilder people, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes over. It takes extreme nutrition interventions, tons of specific exercise. Like you're not going to get really bulky. Um, so I think, really, what I just advise people to do and particularly women is to if your goal is like I want I want to stay at a certain size or I want to fit in these jeans or whatever and, and your bone structure actually still supports that. Right. <laughs> um there's, then, there's that issue yeah, too. <laughs> there's that, yeah. Th then then really what you want to be thinking about is making sure you're eating even more protein. Like that's a reason why I would increase my protein even more. That's the reason why I might supplement with essential amino acids to ensure that I'm hitting those higher levels, even in a situation in which I'm at a, a caloric deficit because I'm trying to cut fat, I will make sure I don't lose muscle. And people think that's maybe not possible. It is. There are examples and, and studies of this showing that through super increased protein intake and through increased essential amino acid intake, you can lose fat and maintain muscle or even gain muscle during that period. It's yeah. because you're prioritizing actually having the amino acids to rebuild the muscle and you're just burning the fat. Because muscle essentially burns fat. It's more metabolically active. The more you have, the more it's gonna yeah. help you keep your metabolism revving, even when you're not exercising. So uh, it's win-win. Like you can't. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. When you, literally when you uh, consume protein or you consume essential amino acids, there's diet-induced thermogenesis it increases your metabolism immediately because it's kicking off this process of building new proteins. That takes energy. You have to burn energy to build these new proteins in the body to build more muscle. And then once you have more muscle, you have more mass, that's lean mass that you're carrying around that helps you burn more calories. So you can actually eat more of the things you like, um, et cetera. And then when you exercise naturally, you're moving that muscle even more and it burns even more calories. So it really is like, it's the most, efficient, effective way to both get, I think, the body that people think that they want and actually live a long time and try to prevent later stage disease as much as we can. Like it's, um, it's just such a smart choice that kind of gets us all the things we want. I yeah, think it's the, most it's people want of youth. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, that's why I say it's non-negotiable. I always tell folks, you know, put a slab of muscle on your meat suit. Like add more meat to your meat suit to be more resilient. It's, mm -hmm. it's critical for hormonal health. It's critical for immune modulation. It's critical for so many, so many things. Uh, you know, you talked about thermogenesis. It's funny. I, so I, like many women over 40 have thyroid issues and I'll find myself in these cold snaps where I can't get my body warm. I literally just feel like I'm shutting down and it's anyone who's experienced it. I've talked about it before on the show and folks have written in and said, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's painful and you can't get warm. And of course I'm like trying to cuddle up to my husband. I'm like, come here, this is your job. <laughs> you're supposed to warm me up. You're my Bunsen burner. And he's like, woman, get your temperature regulated, you know, and he teases me about it, but your ability to regulate your temperature, especially in cold and hot scenarios is a real sign of vitality. The one thing I've noticed, and I cannot believe it took me this many years of my life, but I was a child of the eighties and nineties. So I was in that whole, like starve yourself, look like a heroin chic, you know, that mm -hmm. was the big thing when I was young. So we were all as skinny as humanly possible. And, uh, my goal was to have my wrists or my upper arms be the same size as, as my wrists at all times. Like that's how much I would self starve. I've come to realize if I just eat some steak or <laughs> some meat, it, it, just straight up, like particularly ruminant animals. I'm a fan of, if I just eat some steak, I'm immediately warm immediately. Mm -hmm. I immediately mm -hmm. within seconds, I warm up and I'm like, Oh, I just needed to eat <laughs> rocket science. Right. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Oh, that orthorexia, that anorexia, all of that's in there somewhere deep in my brain. And every once in a while, I'm like, duh, Tina, you're a doctor. Just go eat some protein. You'll warm up and you can <laughs> stop freezing to death. So um, speaking of what are your thoughts around, because I know the science, I've tracked the science on this. And it's all over the place. Thoughts around eating protein adjacent to a workout prior to, after. Mm -hmm you know, we've heard you're supposed to eat it within 30 minutes or 30 minutes prior others or consume it, your amino acids. Others say, as long as you've done it within two hours, others say, as long as you've hit the threshold that day, what are your thoughts around that? 
you made a great point. There's a lot of studies, like hundreds of studies yeah. on protein timing, amino acid intake timing in and around exercise, different population groups, whether young or old. So I think what I want to provide is just an overview of what I conclude from it. And I think it's very similar to what kind of the leaders in the field have concluded from it, the people who have run most of these labs. And I've read a lot of their meta-analyses and summaries and trying to just be like, you know, what, what is the best when you consume essential amino acid of dose, you will stimulate uh, muscle protein synthesis, kick off this process in which you start building new proteins. That process lasts for about, lasts for about three hours. Now it could be shorter or longer depending on the type of protein, how long it takes to digest, et cetera, but that's about how long it lasts. If you consume more protein during that period, it doesn't really increase that muscle, it doesn't increase the duration of the muscle protein synthesis. It doesn't uh, really impact it that much. So it's really kind of like when you consume it at one time in a high enough dose, it has a certain amount of impact and that lasts for about three hours. So overall, if you were really trying to optimize your uh, maintenance of muscle, then you would consume amino acids about every three hours. That is an example of bodybuilders. It's like bodybuilders waking up in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. and eating chicken, and then again at six. And then, you know, it's like, they're like, they're, because that's their whole focus. That's their whole life is to get that kind of amount of muscular tissue. So that's, I'm not encouraging that you need to eat protein every, you know, <laughs> wake yourself in the middle of the night to have amino acids or protein. But that's kind of like the ideal way of consuming it. So then the question comes, well, how does this relate to exercise then? So around exercise, when you do um, resistance training, um, it's different from if you do endurance training. Um, with endurance training, consuming amino acids or protein beforehand or during does not significantly increase the muscle protein synthesis spike. It doesn't make you produce a higher amount of new muscle protein synthesis. If you consume amino acids or protein before an endurance or during that activity, what it does is basically it fuels you with more energy. Not energy, just uh, not energy like carb energy, but energy in the way in which um, when you're doing endurance exercise, you oxidize the amino acids in your blood at a much higher rate because your muscle, because they actually, the amino acids aren't just there to build new proteins. They actually facilitate the process of ATP. They're some of the major facilitators of ATP. They're converting carbs or fat into ATP and thus more of them are being used. So your amino acid levels are going down in your blood. And then to get the amino acids back up in the blood, your body says, I need to break down existing muscle tissue to supply the blood with more amino acids, which then contributes to more muscle protein breakdown when you exercise, it contributes to muscle fatigue. You're breaking down your muscles, getting tired. Um, so if you were to consume amino acids or protein before or during endurance exercise, it's basically gonna allow you to run more, swim longer, and not get fatigued. And it's going to help um, amongst other things. And it's gonna help to prohibit as much muscle protein breakdown afterwards and to help you from getting a sore. It's gonna support with recovery. If you consume right after you do an endurance exercise, it is obviously not gonna give you more energy while you're doing the endurance exercise uh, or help you know prevent the muscle fatigue, but it really enhances the recovery period and helps it helps limit the amount of muscle protein breakdown afterwards and the muscle protein synthesis in that period afterwards. On the other hand, if you're doing resistance exercise, it's a little different. Consuming essential amino acids in, as a free form or as a protein before greatly increases the amount of muscle protein synthesis. And actually essential amino acids contribute, and this is in young healthy adults, so, in, for, so someone who's you know, 40 or older, uh, it's going to be even greater, but in young, healthy ag adults, uh, free form essential amino acids uh, stimulate three times the muscle protein synthesis as a whey protein isolate, which is kind of like the gold standard in sports performance. Um, three times the amount as a uh, whey protein isolate, and it greatly supports and encourages the muscle protein synthesis that's already occurring through the strength training. So if you're, if what you're trying to do is get basically more out of a resistance training workout, 
through increased muscle protein synthesis, you want to get more strength, more endurance than consuming before will contribute to that. Consuming during will also, and consuming after will also. But if you like had to choose one before will actually give you the most muscle protein synthesis. So it'll give you the most gains, we might call it. You'll probably get more recovery consuming afterwards. Like you won't be as sore, et cetera. Um, but you'll get actually the most amount of gains consuming before. So I would just say is whenever you take it, it's good. Like if, if, you, take, <laughs> right. if, if you consume, uh, rather than trying to get too comp, you know, I, I want to give everyone all the information, but if you take it before, during, or after any of these types of exercises, it's good for you. Your body wants it. It's going to help prevent muscle protein breakdown, and it's going to contribute to some amount of new muscle protein synthesis. It's going to help you get more out of the exercise, more gains and reduce the recovery time. But there are little nuances that you can kind of pull these different levels, levers, if you're really interested in it. Okay. That's a great answer. I appreciate it. I, I am, yeah. I'm of the same camp. It's like, just get it in mm -hmm. and get your workouts in and don't yeah. people overcomplicate things. And I, I think that, I think it's a, a strange form of orthorexia that when the average person starts to like really complicate, I'm just like, yeah. just eat. Yeah. <laughs> just so eat, ho ho eat ho hopefully I didn't overcomplicate that for the <laughs> no, listeners. No. What I would just say is, uh, so in agreement with you, adherence, I would yeah. say is the most important thing. You consuming protein or taking essential amino acid supplement and exercising is what is what I would endorse. Yes. <laughs> Whenever you do that, however you do it, if you can do it a few days a week, like that's, you're on the right path. I agree. That's the ticket. And in yeah. keeping it doable, I am not a friend, uh, a fan of endurance, too much endurance working out. I, I feel like it can be quite oxidative for folks. And so that's my reasoning. People always ask me like, why aren't you a fan of cardio? I'm like, eh, I'm a fan of walking. I just am not a fan <laughs> of what you just explained. Oxidizing your amino acids and breaking them down is not as we age. Uh, I'm less of a fan of that, more of a fan of the resistance training for, for folks. Um, I want to talk about essential amino acids and supplementation, but first, can you quickly touch on protein powder and collagen powder? Like yeah. how are these different or similar? Um, yeah. So um, what I would say is if someone has this goal daily of trying to, to consume more protein, you know, like you're trying to get to the closer to this, like gram of gram protein per pound of body weight, protein powder is a great, is one tool that can help you get there. I think what you want to do is you want to ensure that that protein powder that you're choosing does have a complete essential amino acid profile. It needs to have all nine amino acids. If your body is okay with it, everyone has different sensitivities, a whey protein isolate. So like a grass fed whey protein isolate has the best profile. And um, if you're lactose intolerant, typically those whey protein isolates are fine. I'm lactose intolerant. I'm, I'm somewhat lactose intolerant. It doesn't bother me at all. It's virtually lactose intolerant. Um, if you have a you know dairy allergy, it's going to be different. Outside of that, I mean, I think looking at like egg white protein powders can be something to consider. When you start getting into vegan protein powders, I'm not a huge fan because what you're doing is you're taking a lot of plant material that's grown in the ground and you're, you're extracting out of it these certain proteins and simply stuff that's grown in the ground like that has a lot of heavy metals and it has to go through a lot of processing. So you end up with something that's like, for me, it's pretty toxic. Like I, I, just, I don't, I don't want to eat something with that, that much of heavy metals. I'm not afraid of any, of, of any metals, but like, it, it's pretty, I just always advise people to not do plant-based protein powders. I'm with um, you. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, that's actually, and I'll, I'll get to collagen in a second, that essential amino acids are a great solution though for vegans because ones like Keon aminos are 100% plant-based. They're actually fermented from plants. So it's a great vegan option um, that is very efficient and very helpful. Again, as long as you're eating whole food proteins in addition to that, et cetera, I think it's, that's another population group where I'd be like, definitely consider essential amino acids as a supplement. Collagen is interesting. Collagen is, a, I think it's a great supplement. It's not a complete protein. It doesn't have an ideal essential amino acid profile. What it does have is a very high amount of hydroxyproline, proline, and glycine, which are all helpful non-essential amino acids for, sk for skin, for hair, for nails, for joints. So I think if, if your goal is to, as you get older, not um, to make it easier for your body to have direct access to these non-essential amino acids that promote skin, 
hair, et cetera, it's a good supplement. I would not count it as part of your daily protein intake. I agree. I, yeah. I completely agree. I think of yeah. that as additional supplementation yeah. on top of, would you consider the branch chain amino acids as part of your protein intake, or would you consider that adjunctive as well? Uh, so branch chain amino acids on their own are branch chain amino acids are three of the nine essential amino acids. Okay. And they are three very important uh, uh, essential amino acids that said taken in isolation as their own supplement, they have virtually no effect and they're a waste of money. Okay. The research on branch chain amino acids is fairly old. It's 40 years old. Um, and basically people have continued to market them and try to sell them, et cetera. But there's pretty conclusive studies over the last 20 years, great meta-analyses that kind of, I, mean, I think really sealed the deal in 2017, 2019. Yeah. It just showed basically there's no uh, actually, there's no anabolic response from them in isolation. If you take branch chain amino acids in combination with other food, with other protein sources that are deficient, in those amino acids, you could construct kind of like an ideal intake. For example, okay. if you're vegan, only eating legumes will not give you a complete essential amino acid profile of that protein. You need to combine those legumes with something else. That's why like it's harder to, I think it's harder to get your daily protein and essential amino acid intake on a, on a plant-based diet because you need to combine a lot of foods. Um, so it's like, it's kind of like that. Like if you're willing to do the work to combine branch chain amino acids supplement with other food groups and try like kind of concoct this kind of perfect thing, they could potentially be beneficial, but taken on their own, they have their, have their waste of money. And they're potentially actually negative because then your body is getting this large input of these three, these three amino acids, but it doesn't have the other six that it needs to stimulate the muscle protein synthesis. So it has the potential to actually force your muscle tissue to break down to stimulate new protein synthesis. So it's the really, I would just tell people don't take BCAs. Yeah, I agree. In isolation. Yeah. yeah. I remember reading that literature a few years ago and just going, Mer, mer. <laughs> there goes that. <laughs> no, I love it. I love that you're delivering all this information too. This is a lot of things <laughs> I think about. I get a lot. Of, you're answering a lot of questions from my audience. So this is great. Over the years, people have asked these questions and I appreciate that you condensing it all down and making it really, really easy to understand. So amino or essential amino acids, there's nine of them. Mm -hmm. You've got that in your product. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that. Let's talk about the nine essential amino acids. What makes a good essential amino acid product and just more about this. So I think overall, whether it's, whether it's the Keon product or, or you're out looking at other brands, there is very, uh, there's publicly available research over the last few decades that makes it very clear what works and what doesn't work um, by excellent research institutions and labs and a, a diversity of funding sources too. If you ever think, oh, who funded that? Like, it's pretty. It's pretty uh, a wide array um, of funding sources and of researchers. And so I think it's um, it's pretty clear. And what what has come to be known is that if you're going to take an essential amino acid supplement, and this is for young people, this is for athletes, this is for adults, this would be for perimenopausal and postmenopausal women. I mean, really, like the the whole spectrum. Um, you ideally would start with a formula that includes all nine essential amino acids. So I'm basically going to describe what the formula is, what okay. the proportions are. You want all nine essential amino acids and you start at the proportions that they exist in human skeletal muscle. So if I, if I broke down my human skeletal muscle, how much leucine is there? How much isoleucine? How much valine? You, you start with those amounts. And then through, I mean, decades of research, you increase the leucine more than it is at that level to become 40% of the final formula. Then you, and leucine is one of those BCAAs. Then you also increase the isoleucine and the valine to maintain the proportions that they originally had in the form because they, they've now been set out of want, right? Because you've increased the leucine. And then you increase the lysine because lysine is actually also a limiting factor for protein synthesis because it's slower to enter muscle tissue. And voila, that's the formula. That is the formula that has been used in many of these studies for grants by significant institutions at US military, NIH, NASA, sports publications, elderly studies for hospitals, et cetera. Um, that, that's really the ideal formula. So you would want to find a company that has that formula. If you go, I mean, 
difference. If you look at the Keon Aminos bottle, it's transparent. It's on the back. That's the breakdown. You would look for something very close to that. Um, I think if a company does not list the amount of each individual amino acid, immediately don't purchase that product because you don't know. You don't know what proportions they're putting in it. Um, number two, if they don't have all nine, if they only have eight or they only have three, I wouldn't buy it. Um, so I think, you know, those, those are kind of foundational on the actual science of, of essential amino acid nutrition. You want all nine and you want them in those, those proportions. Um, in terms of dosage, what's been studied, you asked earlier about like, you know, what's the minimum, I think you asked what's the minimum effective dose of like leucine or what, how much leucine mm -hmm. do you need? There's a lot of different studies on this, but actually what we found is that in a, as small as a three gram serving of essential amino acids, with 40% of it being leucine. So that's less than three grams of leucine, right? That's a little, what's that amount? 1.3, whatever, 40% of three grams. Mm -hmm. You will stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Um, for most adults though, a five gram serving is pretty good. There are linear improvements all the way up to 15 grams. So if you were to take three servings of Keon Aminos, it, in a linear fashion, it gets better and better and better and better. You don't need to. I mean, like you don't need to be doing that. After that complete, you know, after like say 15 gram serving, there's benefits, but they decrease. Um, okay. So really you're looking at somewhere between three and 15 grams. And for most people, that's why like with Keon Aminos, it's a five gram serving. That's ideal. Some other, you know, there, there could be reasons why you would make different serving sizes, but five grams for most people is a good, you know, I think, uh, serving idea, unless you are, you have the, you know, the direction of like, you're really trying to put on more muscle or you're recovering from some type of situation and you, you need to like absolutely maintain the muscle. You need to build more, et cetera. You could be looking at up to 15 grams. Um, or if you, this. you know, own the company, I, I'll, I'll take a 15 gram serving. <laughs> <laughs> do you do all 15 grams at once or do you space it throughout the day? So that's actually what I'm saying. So up to 15 grams at once. One serving. Okay. Is linear, it, like it is three times as good as five, like five grams. I gotcha. Um, but you know, you don't, you don't need, you don't need to do that. You'll get plenty of benefit at the five grams. Um, and I think it depends on what my activity levels are in the day. Like I, I take that much every morning and I have a cup of coffee and that's kind of like my first three hours of the day. And then I eat a few hours later. Um, but that makes sure that I get that core essential amino acid, the equivalent of protein early in the day. Yeah. Um, I like that. Yeah. Um, but like if I, I train, um, just in the last year, I'm a, I'm a big walker. I love walking. I walk at least 15,000 steps a day. I'm a big walker. I like resistance training, but I've gotten really into Muay Thai and kickboxing in the last yeah. year. Cause my son actually got into it. And on days when I'm training Muay Thai, I take a lot, like I'll take serving before, during and after, because I want to make sure I don't get injured. I want to make sure like I have as much energy for the class as possible. I want to have the best recovery. Um, and it's a taxing, it is a more taxing kind of hit cardio type environment. So I think nutrition in and around that makes a lot more sense. Um, yeah. And so I think then beyond that, once you get out of the formula, it's like, are there a bunch of other weird additives in it? Or, you know, do they use, um, natural flavors or is there, you know, artificial sweeteners, you know? So I think just looking, whatever your values are, my values are, um, the most natural, minimal, you know, organic suitable ingredients that we can get. And so that's why we chose that in our product, but I have respect for people who make whatever other decisions they want, if they like yeah, artificial well, sweeteners got... or what, you know, that's not my thing. You, you have the powdered version and the capsule version, right? Yeah. And so the capsules, is, I, I take the capsules, the capsules that's, it's really just the amino acids. So yeah, yeah. there's no flavoring no, I, at all. For folks who, some folks like powders, some folks don't like powders and mm -hmm. you know, whatever their yeah. jam is, if they're doing a smoothie, whatnot. I find that your powders alone with water. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I was, I'm not a powder fan. So I'm like, wow, I'm drinking a powder, but I could tell that you didn't add a lot of junk to it to make it super. There's no know, junk. It's and, super it, clean. It goes great in juice. It goes great in a smoothie. It goes great. You know, it's, it's really easy to, to get down. And then the capsules I haven't tried yet, but I like the idea. I just get sick of taking pills. So I always yeah. try to mix it up. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned energy. Can you touch on that real quick before we close? Cause I find that that's, you know, uh, we want to, I love my coffee in the morning and I love my coffee in the afternoon. I love a little bit of coffee in the afternoon and 
as I'm aging, I'm finding myself a little bit more sensitive to it than I mm -hmm. once was. How can essential amino acids help with energy versus, you know, going after the caffeine? So the, uh, I think the underlying science or kind of uh, human biochemistry, it's important to understand is that our mood is largely impacted by neurotransmitters. And more or less neurotransmitters create different types of moods. Now it's a little bit different with cat with caffeine. When you take caffeine, it's an, it's like a, an adenosine blocker. So it actually kind of blocks mm -hmm. certain types of information to the brain or feelings. But if you have more or less different types of amino acids, or you have a regulated amount of, of uh, amino acids, you are likely to have a more regulated mood. So I think another thing too, it's like you talked about, you know, encouraging people who are maybe really thin or weak, et cetera. I think one of the first things for people to look at if they're having mood issues or energy issues or overall kind of brain fog, look at your daily protein and essential amino acid intake. If you're not eating enough, or if maybe you're not eating them, eating it, eating it frequently enough. You know, some people can are fine with two meals a day, some three, some may need four or five. And by doing that, it helps regulate the amino acids in their blood and thus helps regulate their mood more. And so I think just understanding that, then you start to get a picture of like, wow, maybe I'm not tired. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like lacking this core nutrient that Any actually, food. <laughs> is, that's the precursor. Yeah. Like I need these essential amino acids that are the precursor to like, to my mood, to the neurotransmitters oh, that wow. create my mood. So I think that's, that's the main thing I would say, um, you know, on another level, as I stated earlier in exercise, but even outside of exercise, amino acids play a very key role in um in in facilitating atp mm -hmm. so facilitating the way that we actually create not create energy but but convert energy um amino acids also there's some really interesting studies uh again this is the kind of stuff that's more um in vitro or animal studies i did not again i hadn't talked about that yet but i think anytime people talk about you know mitochondrial health it's not like really clear human outcome studies but yeah. uh in studies at the cellular level it's shown that essential amino acids create as much or more mitochondrial biogenesis than fasting or than caloric restriction. Wow. And in a much more sustainable way, if you think about elderly populations where it's like the last thing you want to tell your 75 year old client is like, you should intermittent fast in the morning. You know, right. it's like that person, you're wanting that person to get in protein, to get in amino acids, et cetera. And so, um, it can it can actually support you at that level of energy. That's less about you know like your mental energy and your mental mood, but literally in the production of energy, literally in in helping you have more mitochondria to make it easier for your body to convert energy, to make it easier for your body to move. Um, essential amino acids play a really key role. That's a way more fun way to do it than starving yourself for half the day too. So <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm yeah, and, yeah, and essential amino acids. I mean, they're um, they are satiating as well. So it's like uh, they. This is great. Yeah. This is seriously such great information. You know, it's like you think you know something, and then you get to hear it from someone else in a different way, and it's like, oh yeah, you know, so many good things here because. I take for granted the amount of supplements I have at my disposal. And I sometimes get overwhelmed and I don't know how to prioritize. Even as a naturopathic physician, I'm just like, Ugh, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by it all. But I, I love the idea of just, I, I'm going to try taking this every morning and see, I like that 15 gram challenge <laughs> in the morning and see how it yeah. goes. Cause something, you know, you mentioned mood. I will find myself by 10 AM riddled with anxiety and mm. feeling quite on edge. And my temper is quicker to trigger. Mm -hmm. If I don't have some, a, a chunk, like I need a chunk of steak in the morning or a big serving of ground beef, even just a big bowl of ground beef. I come downstairs to go to work. Everything's much easier throughout the day. It makes a big difference. Those neurotransmitters. I think of so many young people and elderly people who are malnourished and just not making good food choices and what that impact is on their neurotransmitters and leading to such a massive amount of prescription antidepressants when really they just, there's a very fundamental solution in, yeah, in like diet. Just, and I, and I don't mean to sound, I mean, I don't mean to sound like the kid of hippie natural health parents who's like, well, it's, you just got to eat the thing. But like the it's pretty clear science of like 
that this is what's going on in our body and we need these things in our body to to regulate these things now people could have other mental health issues and have other mood related things or trauma etc but i think in so many cases people are having um, some component of their mental distress whether it's anxiety like you described just in the morning or it's other types of mood imbalances it's consider consider protein and amino acid nutrition as one of the key components. And I think most people will find like, wow, that had a pretty big impact on me. Maybe it didn't yes. solve the whole thing, but it can have a pretty big impact. I, I agree completely. My daughter who, my daughter and I have had similar struggles at the, the same ages, you know, when I was her age and she struggles with depression. And she said, mom, you know that the, the studies are showing that protein and exercise can really help with depression. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I haven't. I've only been telling you this for God knows how long. <laughs> She's like, I'm going to pay attention to that. I was like, thank you. <laughs> it just goes to show that people come to their conclusions when they get there, you know, yeah. and hopefully each, each planting of the seed gets them there. And I hope that this has been an informative podcast for my audience and understanding how critical this is. Cause I joke, you know, people always say, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? I'm like, eat more protein and lift weights, eat more protein and lift weight. That's always my answer. I'm like, go out in the sun, eat more protein, lift weights, go sleep. You know, they want it to be complicated. And I'm like, it's really not, it's, these are some fundamental truths. They really are. And I mean, if they're doing all of that, then maybe there's, there's more to talk about, but if you're not doing that yet, then. Yeah. Start there. Yeah, start there. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So you guys have a, you have a great, uh, amino acid, essential amino acid product. And like I said, it comes in powder and capsules. You've got a delicious protein powder as well. And so my listeners can access all of these through the link that I'm going to share in the show notes, but it's, it's a simple URL. If you guys are listening, it's get Kion, G E T K I O N.com or get Kion. Sorry. I'm, I'm reading it phonetically forward slash Dr. Tina. So get Kion.com forward slash Dr. Tina, and you guys can check out the products there. Um, is there anything you want to add before I bid you adieu? This has been such a valuable time. I appreciate it so much. I, I think I just, you know, repeat again that it's just like step by step, like try, I, if any way I shared a lot of information and people are like, whoa, like that was so much like choose one thing from it that's meaningful and that's actionable and try to just implement and use that and just you're doing great, whoever you are. If you're listening <laughs> to this podcast, if you're listening to this podcast and trying to be a little bit healthier, you know, just t take one, take one more step. Well, I want to encourage my audience to do this challenge with me. I'm, I'm launching it right now. I want everybody to try these amino acid or these aminos and do five to 15 grams in the morning, just that. And let's see what happens. I, I bet body composition will change. I bet energy will change. I bet mood will change. And I want everyone to email me and let me know what they find out. So I love um, it. Yeah, Angela, this has been such an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your wide breadth of knowledge. And I appreciate the work you're doing. So thanks for coming on the Dr. Tina show. Thanks, Dr. Tina. Yeah. <laughs>